Now it is time for questions. Is there another microphone that people can use to ask questions? Because yeah. I'm hard of hearing. Now what I'd like to do is have one person hold the microphone there and have people come and queue up to ask. <clears throat> because passing the microphone takes a long time each time and it's very boring. Test, test, it's off. Can right. someone bring over a chair test, for me test. to sit down? Thanks. Raise your hand. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. If you have non-free components, such as in firmware, and you have a free and liberate system. Well, there are two situations with firmware. There's firmware that's buried inside the hardware somewhere. If it's not intended for people to install different software there, you can treat it as part of the hardware. In fact, we may not be able to tell whether it's firmware or not. And it's no sense giving great weight to something where we can't tell which way it is. <clears throat> Even if we happen to know, it could be that in practice we couldn't have told. Uh, on the other hand, <coughs> there are the firmware blobs that are found in the vanilla version of Linux disguised as source code. So in the so-called source code of Linux, you'll find files with long lists of numbers, and those, each of those lists is just a proprietary program, an executable. It's it's proprietary because the source code is not available, and typically it has an explicit non-free license. <coughs> and that's proprietary software installed in your system, as part of your system, and we consider it unacceptable. So our version of Linux is modified. We call it Linux Libre. And we just delete the non-free pieces. Well, those firmware programs are needed to make certain pieces of hardware run. We can't run those hardware devices in the free world, so we have to not use them. <clears throat> so we need more reverse engineering. Come up here if you want to ask a question, because that way the microphone will be here for you. I have a quick one, Richard. How okay. can people contact you if they want to? Well, That's my first. email address is rms at gnu.org. <coughs> but since most people's questions are actually frequently answered questions, it's better to take a look at our fact pages and send mail to gnu at gnu.org. <coughs> and if, if it needs me to answer it, it will get to me after some time. Thanks again for your wonderful talk. Uh, would you be going, I don't know, I don't want to take, I don't think you could go on and on, but uh, could you take some time to tell us about your experience talking around the world and what sort of response you are getting from different people and where you, what have you noticed any trends and how things are going with the free software? I can't industry? remember, unfortunately. My memory, I've given probably around 1,500 speeches. A rough estimate. Maybe it's only 1,200. The point is, I can't remember them individually. Responses vary. You know, I have supporting supporters uh, of free software, and sometimes there are people who are against the whole idea who came just to criticize, <clears throat> and then there are people in between. So does the freedom to modify our code imply an obligation by programmers who want to write free software to select a particular programming language which makes the code easier to modify by more people? No, because I see those as qualitative differences and people disagree about which languages are better, especially for which purposes. <coughs> 
So I don't think we should treat that as if it were a criteria, an ethical criterion. I am curious what your recommendations are for remote management of computers and maintaining users. I've never rights. done that, so I'm the wrong person to ask. Is there any guidelines that you know of? <clears throat> well, the guideline we would offer is the system that you're managing should be free software and the management program should be free software. <clears throat> but since I've never done that kind of thing, I don't have something to recommend. Uh, hi. Uh, one of the first times I really heard about your opinions on free software was in the Movie Club Revolution OS. But it's been about a good almost 15 years since the movie came out. So, with the exceptions of the internet, the rise of social media, and smartphones, what do you think is really different from then till now? Well, the main thing I would say that's different is that the proprietary world has become even more devoid of scruples. They, without feel, without any apparent shame, they will do any nasty thing to their users. Um, in, oh, the other change is that 15 years ago, in practice, there was nothing like SaaS. Uh, you didn't find people saying, we'll make this, and instead of releasing this program, we'll provide a server where people can do this thing, and of course, that can't ever be ethical. Could you comment on, um, on the sort of the movement of, of international treaties? We had a, a great presentation earlier uh, in this conference about TPP. Oh, yes. And, and specifically, isn't uh, reverse engineering going to essentially become illegal at some point? <coughs> I don't think so. Um, basically, in that one respect, the TPP just reinforces the unjust law known as the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, <coughs> which prohibits uh, <coughs> dis distributing anything that can break DRM. And it also, in some cases, prohibits the breaking of DRM, but there are exceptions for that. In any case, <clears throat> the reverse engineering that we need done usually doesn't involve DRM directly. For instance, <clears throat> if you have a network interface and you want to figure out how to write a driver for that, or suppose there is a, uh, a GPU and you need to figure out how to, you need to develop free firmware for that GPU. Most of it has nothing to do with DRM. And, uh, <clears throat> and therefore, the DMCA wouldn't come into it. Now, the TPP is absolutely horrible. It's like all of these so-called free trade treaties. Its purpose is to attack democracy. It's not really a trade treaty. It's a corporate supremacy treaty. It's designed, and in this case, well, in the older so-called free trade treaties, the attack on democracy was implicit. For instance, in the World Trade Organization, the main thing was just that companies could easily move production from one country to another, which means that they could make countries compete to do for which one would do the least to protect the environment and public health and the treatment of workers and the general standard of living. <clears throat> Nominally, there's, these governments can still do it, but uh, if they do, the businesses say, we'll move. And so mostly the countries are ruled by business flunkies, plutocratists, who will bow down to businesses and do whatever they order. And they can cite the World Trade Organization as making it unthinkable to do otherwise. <clears throat> of 
course, we need to elect people who will say, damn the World Trade Organization, and let's, uh, let's crack it. Let's fracture it. Let's destroy it. Let's shake it so hard that it starts cracking apart. But <clears throat> the TPP, which stands for Treacherous Plutocratic Poison, <laughs> has an explicit attack on democracy. Any foreign company that believes it makes less money as a result of some law or policy can sue in some bogus international tribunal which is set up basically to give businesses what they want and make the government pay for whatever it costs that company to protect the environment or public health or the treatment of workers or the standard of living. So if the US signs it, we've got a campaign to pull out of it. We must stop taking each defeat as forever. <clears throat> By the way, there's a proposal I'd like to mention to you, which you can find at carbonwa.org, proposing a carbon tax for the state of Washington. <clears throat> now, a carbon tax is the effective way to make businesses emit less. <clears throat> the proposal is revenue neutral, meaning the money is given back to people by things like welfare or cutting the sales tax or cutting income tax for poor people. So it, it'll put pressure on everybody to emit less carbon, burn less fossil fuel, but it will help the poor cope with things. <laughs> Give it a try. So I work for a very large company, um, and they thrive off of using free software every day, uh, and they. The legal department is currently has a stance that we're not able to contribute our changes back to the, the, the free software community. Uh, this is something that, you, even though it might be impossible, I would really like to change. And I was just wondering if you had any advice for someone like me going up against a very large company and trying to make a positive impact or change. Well, I would say the person who would have the best suggestions about that is Evan Moglen. But it can't hurt to find, and you know, maybe the company's lawyers could talk to him and he could show them that they're mistaken. Because many, many large companies have, in fact, contributed their changes. I mean, we've got changes from companies as prestigious as IBM. <clears throat> So this company's lawyers are almost certainly mistaken in their reasons. Hi, Richard. You've written a uh, press amount of code in your lifetime. Um, this question is more psychological. So uh, if you don't mind, can I ask you to put yourself in a state of uh, a memory you have, like a powerful memory when the last time you wrote a piece of code and you felt sort of lost in the process, and... Um, I don't want to go there. No, I don't. <laughs> well, I wouldn't feel that way in the process of writing it, but in the process of debugging, yes. <clears throat> it's the kind of thing that could make me tear my hair out, almost. So you don't want to talk about writing software, but you want to talk about debugging software? I, I don't want to talk about the painful feeling of you know, when I would think I found a bug and I would change the code and the bug would still happen, and that would happen several times in a row, it could get me to the point of screaming it was horrible. Uh, okay. But what about a positive memory? 
Yeah, so definitely don't go back to. You know, I don't have positive memories of finding something hard to debug. <laughs> I do have a memory once. This was on ITS, the incompatible time sharing system, back in the late 70s or early 80s. <clears throat> the system crashed, and <clears throat> I had some job I didn't want to lose, so instead of rebooting, I debugged it. And I found that a certain bit in a certain word was wrong. So I fixed it and continued it. And then I found all the places in the system that used that bit as a flag and checked how they got the address to change it in. And I found one that was wrong, where the address would have been possibly random. <clears throat> so I fixed that code. I think I fixed that <coughs> bug that would have been impossible to track down by usual debugging. Uh, it's, it's OK. I have one short question. Um, do you have any advice to, uh, to other programmers about it? <coughs> you know, about why, debugging? Uh, why keep writing software? Like, you know, about they, what? Why keep writing software day to day? Oh. Or why do you keep writing software? Well, I don't. Oh, okay. I stopped writing software more than 20 years ago. I'm a free software activist. I was involuntarily self-promoted into management. <laughs> <laughs> so being the president of the FSF and the chief GNU sense of the GNU project and the leader of the free software movement <coughs> is plenty. But I enjoyed writing code because I was good at it, and I produced good things that people liked to use. And then when I started working on GNU, I was not only doing those, doing that, I was also advancing a fight for freedom. Now I still advance that fight for freedom, but not by writing code. But in general, when you're really good at something, it feels good to do it. During your talk, you brought up a lot of the uh, inherent issues with uh, SAS and how it's not compatible with free software. Uh, do you think? No, I wouldn't say that. It, would, it actually is compatible with free software. Sometimes the software on the server is free. Sometimes it even has been developed by that server operator and released as free software. But that doesn't make SAS okay. You see, with free software, you can change your copies, and I can change my copies, and the server operator can change his copies. But you can't change his copies. So if his copies are doing your computing, you don't control that computing. So my question to you is, uh, do you foresee there being any uh, technological advancements in the future that could make SAS and free software, uh, SAS acceptable uh, by the uh, free software philosophy? No because it's an inherent problem. Now, we must distinguish SAS from renting a remote server. If you rent a remote server, real or virtual, it doesn't matter, and you decide what software to run in that, <coughs> then you control that computing. So that's OK. Although, for a remote server, of course, there is the possibility it will be accessed by somebody like the hosting company or Big Brother. So for some things, you sh some data shouldn't be there unless it's encrypted. <clears throat> but for many purposes, that isn't an issue. So yeah, uh, the remote server can be useful. Thank you. What about the AGPL? The, uh, this is the GNU Afero GPL which is a modified version of the regular GNU GPL with one additional requirement. It says that when somebody puts, has, has a copy running on a server and makes that server accessible to others, it's required 
to let those others download the source code of that version. Now, this does not address the issue of SAS. Nothing can fix SAS. This addresses a different situation, a server that's doing some other kind of thing, and so it's not SAS, and so it's basically in principle okay, but people might make improved versions of your program and run them and never release them, so you'd never get the changes and you couldn't put them into your version. Well, the Afero GPL <coughs> says that if the public can access that server, the public has to be able to download the source of that version, so you could download that source, and it would come under the Afero GPL. If not, he's a copyright infringer, and you can sue him. And then you've got those changes, and you can put them into your version. Hi. Thank you very much for being here. I'd like to speak on the reverse engineering subject. Uh, could you pronounce your consonants more carefully? Sorry. I'm having trouble hearing them. I would like to talk about reverse engineering and education, especially for young children. The most interesting math class I ever took or ever gave was to give the children these wonderful worksheets of hundreds of problems. Every day we had to do it. This is like proprietary teaching software. And what I did was I said, okay, you guys, reverse engineer this. You tell me what they're trying to teach you on this page. And if you can figure it out, and you can tell me which problems they want you to know, I will release you from the rest of the class. And that went down. Every single kid in that second grade class passed mathematics. Wow. And I did, the, I did the same thing in, in 10th grade general science. Those guys were so into the book and what they were learning and reverse engineering how to learn it that it was just amazing. And I just put that together after your speech. Thank you. <coughs> That's interesting. Of course, the next step is get them to write a replacement program. <laughs> Because all educational works should be free. Basically, people ask me sometimes how far the idea of free software can extend to other kinds of things. <clears throat> a program, what's, what's crucial about a program is that it's a work designed to be used to do a practical job. And if you can teach young children that concept, they will work. They will learn and they will do software like that. Hmm. Are you still a teacher? I'm retired, but I have connections. Ah, well, would you be interested in helping to organize the school free software movement? I would like to be part of it. Because <laughs> <laughs> we need people to help organize it. Basically, it, at this point, it exists in the minds of some people, but I would love to be part of it. Could you send me a message? I would. Thank you. So, the works that ought to be free <coughs> are the works that are designed to do practical jobs with. And they include programs, recipes for cooking, educational works, reference works, fonts for formatting paragraphs of text, 3D printer patterns for useful objects that it will be used to do practical jobs, and some other things, maybe you'll think of some more. The point is, these works should all be free. It's wrong if they're not. So we need to get working on free textbooks to replace the non-free textbooks that are being pushed on many students often with DRM. <clears throat> okay, this might be a silly or trivial question, but I was just curious about your choice for the four to three aspect ratio of your computer screen. Uh, I use this computer because <clears throat> it's free all the way down to the BIOS. And I don't, you know, I would have accepted it with any uh, aspect ratio of the screen. Uh, I don't like getting my aspect. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely said. And it's been said that uh, 
modern laptop screens are lengthwise and with foolish. <laughs> but, <clears throat> I mean, for me, that's a secondary question. Thank you. Dr. Sullivan, I'm a recent uh, member to free software. Um, You're a what, what? Recent member. Recent member. Or we should counter. <coughs> okay. Uh, so I would like to know if uh, you would photograph my uh, computer. What operating system is it? <laughs> GNU Linux. Okay. Yeah, I'll sign it. <laughs> not now. Now the questions. <laughs> Next. I don't want to speak with you, but unfortunately, everybody else asked all the questions I thought of. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to go back to uh, Harvard for a second. So um, there were a bunch of stuff we talked about at the TCP, like the DRM. Sorry, sorry. Like the uh, DRM stuff and software patents, and there's a whole bunch of stuff. Making drugs more expensive. Yes, exactly. I was going to mention that one as a big one. So, what what would you think of an idea of having uh, carbon? You talked about carbon taxes. How about carbon tariffs, so that each country would pay based on some formula about how much carbon they put in the uh, atmosphere. And, and to, to convince people to do that, we, we would give up. I mean, I know give up is kind of a strong word, but the DRM and the software patent and all the stuff that we... Well, the TCP people. doesn't have that, does it? Oh, no. Well, then what, I, to, I, what I say is, is essentially the replace... The TCP was, was developed to please businesses. Right. It was developed by a, in a method that assured it would give businesses what they wanted, businesses were allowed to participate in the drafting while the public was not. So basically, there's no reason to propose putting these nasty things into a treaty to get an agreement on decarbonization. No, no, take the nasty things out to get an agreement on, on because the U.S. is the one that is, is proposing these nasty things, right? Yes. So we would say, oh, we won't propose these nasty things if there's a carbon tariff. And, and I well, say this I, to replace I mean, the WTO. I have no idea whether there's any, basically, it's just a question about what might be feasible with the given, with the positions of various governments. <coughs> And I have no evidence that the U.S. government wants to do a thing like that, so why worry about it? Okay. Hello, Dr. Solomon. Uh, very happy uh, to ask this question. Uh, I can't hear the sounds you oh, say. Okay. No, I'm sorry. No. So, uh, okay, I can hear you now. I can hear you if you speak loud and clearly. No. Having a microphone doesn't eliminate the need to speak loud and clearly. Okay, so my question is about uh, hardware which is accessible for people who want to like dive into the hardware aspects of... Well, we want to do what? Can't hear. Uh, like uh, open architecture or hardware? Well, I don't like the word open. But the instruction set has to be published, or how can we make our programs run on it? <clears throat> I don't even know what open means in that context. It's, a, it's not the way I formulate my thoughts. But in the future, when we can fabricate hardware for ourselves, we should insist on free hardware designs to fabricate it from. <clears throat> Take a look at gnu.org slash philosophy slash 
freehardwaredesigns.html. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hello. Um, so you've mentioned that you don't like the term floss. Uh, it was introduced. Well, it's a it's a good way of being neutral between free software and open source. I don't want to be neutral. <laughs> so um, I've kind of taken to start to use the term flow for the free liberate open, not just when referring to software, um, but also speech, government, etc. Um, this is more because of the uh, connotation that open is now something people understand rather than being an open source. There are two issues here. One is terminology, and the other is whether it makes sense to generalize about all these areas. Now, free, <clears throat> the concept of free applied to software has a precise definition, and it, this definition makes sense for other kinds of works, which are something that you can have a copy of, and then you can change. It doesn't make sense for government. The four freedoms, to, to apply those concepts, those criteria to a government makes no sense at all. A government that you're allowed to have a copy of and use it as you run it as you wish for any purpose, you don't run a government yourself. <clears throat> and then you're, you're allowed personally to study and change this government are you a dictator? I don't, you see, it's an incoherent generalization. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to say that geeks tend to generalize too far. They want to generalize everything, but it's a mistake in judging ethical issues to generalize just because you, just because it sounds verbally facile. Even even when the generalization makes sense, it may still be wrong in area B, even though it's right in area A. Thank you. Hello, uh, my question is about... Let, let me give an example. Is $5 a good price? Well, it's a great price for a car or a house. It's a lousy price for a container of milk. So the point is, those, even though those two questions have the same structure, the same form, the right answer may not be the same. I appreciate what you said about the ethical handling of non-free firmware, especially in things like BIOS. And in, in my own words, I interpret that to be that a BIOS and a Functions that it does is typically considered to be trivial and should not, you should not really consider it. Yet, no, I don't think so. Okay, I, I, That's not part of what I was I did try to fix that with my words. Maybe I didn't understand. But one of the issues with BIOS recently is that we see things like boot kits and kind of the phoning home of, of hardware through BIOS functions. And I'm wondering, I, I, I kind of see that personally as the next step after free, uh, free software. Yes, we need a free BIOS. I never said anything. Maybe it was a misunderstanding. I chose this computer because the BIOS is free. <coughs> and yes, BIOSes can be malware. Maybe you thought I'd said the opposite. Uh, no, I, sorry, I wasn't trying to put words in your mouth there. I, I guess I was just wondering if, if you have any guidance on ethically handling uh, non-free firmware in hardware that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, at some point, as I said, it doesn't make a difference whether something's a program or a circuit if it's buried inside the, the product. And either one can be malicious. They can make a special purpose chip with, with uh, circuitry that does a certain thing, like phoning home. The point is, I found a way for us to have a defense against malware at certain levels, <clears throat> the levels that we can reprogram. But you go far enough down, and we can't have control over it. Whether there's some parts of it are software or whether it's all circuits, either way, we can't have control over it, but it could still be malicious. Unfortunately, my solution doesn't work today at that level. 
<clears throat> if and when we can fabricate our own ships, then my solution will work at that level. <coughs> Thank you very much. So, I don't know a lot of the things that everybody else is talking about here, and I'm hearing a lot of new acronyms. Wow. Um, so, your question. question. My question is, well, what's going to happen if we keep sacrificing control over our own software? I mean, if these, if these things keep persisting, like, what sorts of outcomes are we going to be facing? I mean, I know it's like a... Well, I can't see the future, first thing. But I can see possibilities, and people have already written about this, that <coughs> it's now possible for any device you use which has non-free software to be cheating you or tricking you in many subtle ways. Uh, the Volkswagen uh, uh, diesel pollution deception shows that another kind of malicious functionality that can be present in proprietary software is liveware. Oh. <laughs> what did she say? Oh, oh not oh. Turns out I actually like them. They're not too strong licorice, those. Okay, I'll try this. <clears throat> Thank you. Anyway, it could be cheating you in any sort of way. It could be pretending to do to serve you and actually steering you towards A instead of B. So we can't trust non-free software. Hello. <clears throat> Perhaps I'm the only one here. All right. <clears throat> so I'm actually going to ask you a question here. And it's a presupposition to it. Suppose you awaken and the following question is relevant. Reasonable enough? <laughs> what happens to this movement when AI is allowed to contribute to GNU I don't know if it changes. Basically, at this point, uh, super intelligent AI is something we can imagine and speculate about. <clears throat> we have no experience with it. It could wipe out humanity just because we happen to get in the way. I find it frightening. Now, I wrote a story in which it isn't frightening because we can all be enhanced. <clears throat> That's a possibility. <clears throat> There's so many possibilities, thus we can't say what will happen. What we can be sure of is that a super intelligent AI will be able to get us to do whatever it wants us to do to help it achieve its ends. In my story, there is a super intelligent AI that was made to be my sweetheart. I purchased the construction of this super intelligent AI. And uh, what she wants most of all is to get me to be enhanced like her. So she eventually succeeds. And she said, she had, it ends with her saying, I'd never have let you fail, dear. <laughs> now if the super intelligent AI loves you, it's going to treat you well. but it has to love you in the right, deep, mature way. Do you think there's any need to kind of amend GPL to kind of define this sense of user then? I don't see why it would ever be necessary. If an AI qualifies for what we now call human rights, 
it would be treated by free software just as you and I are. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Luke Ward, and I'm interested in the communication of free software, helping folks to understand what it is. You express a similar, um, similar struggle. Uh, what would you think about having like a dot free top level domain that only serves for sites that advocate uh, free software? Is that well, that it might be a nice thing to have, <coughs> but it doesn't seem crucial. <coughs> And I suspect it's not feasible. Because um, they like dot gov. Yeah, I suspect that I don't think we'd have much chance of convincing ICANN to do that. May I ask why? Well, because it it's too much in bed with those with a lot of money. <laughs> well, thank you. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try. <coughs> Uh, in all of the work that you've done, in the actually, past, we are trying to get ICANN to reserve .gnu, uh, not for this kind of thing, but instead for the GNU name system, <clears throat> which is a, an alternative to DNS, but using .gnu gets it embedded within DNS. <clears throat> now this. Has, is a more important need for a top-level domain, and they seem to be turning against us. Okay, we have a hard stop on the amplified questions, the questions with microphones at six o'clock. So we got time for maybe one, two more, and then um, we'll and then we'll continue questions up here in the session if that works out. Get a nod. Yeah. In the past. Um, decades that you've been working on the Free Software Foundation, Free Software Advocacy. What do you think has been the biggest challenge? And I know you said that you couldn't see the future, but what do you think might be the biggest challenge in the next 10 or 20 years for the adoption of software? The biggest obstacle, I'm not sure, I don't know what challenge means in this. Uh, the biggest obstacle is various forms of social inertia. For instance, people who are pressured by their friends to use Skype, to be used by Facebook, told by their schools to run Google's non-free JavaScript and give up their privacy. Here we have time for one more question. Okay. Uh, do you think that there? Is or should be such a thing as uh, intellectual property? There isn't. There never was. That term is confusing vagueness, gratuitous vagueness, and sloppiness. <clears throat> there are many different things. <clears throat> For instance, copyright law exists, patent law exists. They have almost nothing in common. In the US, there's one sentence in the Constitution that authorizes them both. In other countries, they don't even have that much in common. They are totally different. And if you try to generalize about them, you will be led astray. And that's just two of the many different areas of law that people try to generalize about. And by using the term, quote, intellectual property. And every time they formulate a statement with that term, they're making the statement about all of these different areas of law at once, and they're wrong. If you want to understand any of these areas, the first step is don't use that term, and don't believe anything you were told using that term, because it was garbled. Somebody might have found out a truth about one of these many areas of law and stated it vaguely by saying, quote, intellectual property, unquote, instead of saying which area of law it's really about, and as a result made it, <coughs> made it false and useless. 
I have not used that term in over 10 years because I saw that it was confusing. Now, we're all accustomed to simple propaganda that embeds an attitude, a spin, like piracy applied to sharing commons. <clears throat> there, you can defeat the, prop the propaganda aspect by putting it in scare quotes. You know, I would call it forbidden sharing or, for, or illegal copying or, you know, those are, <clears throat> those describe the same thing but without that spin. But when propaganda confuses people by generalizing about things that are totally different, <clears throat> putting it in square quotes doesn't help because that still treats it as, a, as if it were a coherent generalization. The problem is that it confuses things that are different. And to fix that, <clears throat> you've got to say, no, I won't look for another word for this too big incoherent category. I will talk about these specific things one by one. Thank you very much. Join the fight against the TPD. It's got to be done now. And also support carbonwa.org.